Hello YouTube, in today's video we'll look at the rules and regulations required for fuel and alternate landing airports when conducting an IFR flight in the UK or Europe under commercial air transport rules. We'll look at the general rules behind this and then go for a word example using real world weather. This, now, this video isn't intended to cover all eventualities of regulatory areas, plus the company operations manual that you work with might have a more restrictive criteria, limitations depending on the aircraft equipment, serviceability, type of flying, or if you're single pilot or multi-crew. So please do check the relevant sections of the AOP or the manual before flight. Now, first of all, you need to look at a general synoptic picture and understand what's driving the current weather when you're gonna go flying. This is important when selecting an alternate airport. There's no choice point in choosing another alternate airport nearby that's going to be affected by the same air mass and weather conditions as your destination because it'll be too bad to land at potentially. Now starting with the departure you need to have a visibility of at least 400 meters. Now that raises to 500 meters if you're flying single pilot and 800 meters at night. The cloud base has to be greater than your takeoff decision point, your TDP, uh, and your minimum IMC speed and within the autopilot engagement li limits. Otherwise, you can't take off safely. So make sure that cloud base is sufficiently high that you can still maintain those visual references during the takeoff. <laughs> Next, we need to think about options if we need to return to our takeoff location, if we were to have a critical emergency, such as an engine failure, uh, a single engine failure early on in the flight. The weather at that takeoff location needs to be sufficiently good, both in terms of cloud base and visibility to allow a VFR approach back to that same location. And if it has an incident approach, the minimum descent altitudes and the visibility requirements are lower than the current weather, so you can actually safely perform an instrument approach back to that takeoff location. Now, if either of these answers are no, then you need to find yourself a takeoff alternate that is within one hour's flight time from the departure location, where the weather is either sufficient for a VFR approach or the weather is above the instrument approach minimums for one hour either side of your ETA back at this takeoff alternate. Now, if you're on a short flight and your destination is only an hour away, then in that case, your destination can be your takeoff alternate. Now, moving on, we need to look at the weather at our intended destination. Is VFR conditions forecast for the time of arrival? I.e. is the cloud ceiling above the initial approach, fixed altitude and visibility greater than 800 meters? If the weather is good and it meets these criteria, then great, you don't need to have an alternate destination. However, if this isn't the case, then you need to have one or even two different alternate airports lined up. Now, the number of alternate airports does depend on the weather forecast at your destination. If the weather is below the VFR limits, but still above the minimums for the planned instrument approach uh, for the time of arrival, plus or minus one hour, then only one alternate uh, destination airfield is required. However, if the weather forecast for your destination isn't favorable and the worst of the predicted weather is below the minimums for approach, or indeed there isn't a weather forecast available, then you need to select two alternate destinations. In order for an alternate airport to be appropriate, you need to check that the weather forecast for that alternate for a period one hour either side of your planned arrival time is above the minimums required there for the instrument approach that you plan to fly. You have to adjust the published approach minimums in both the runway visibility and the cloud base to provide a safety factor for your flight. Firstly, you need to increase the RVR minimum, the runway visual range minimum from the published value, increasing it by 400 meters. And secondly, you need to increase the minimum ceiling, raising the minimum descent altitude or decision height by 200 feet above the published numbers. Now, if the selected alternate has a forecast of worse weather one, other, one hour either side of your arrival that is below these new limits, you can't use that airfield. And if you can't find another alternate that works within your maximum fuel load, then you legally can't conduct the flight. Now, that takes us on to fuel planning which is obviously dependent on the helicopter you fly and the fuel burn. I use an estimated value of about three kilograms per minute on the EC135 at cruise, which works out about 200 kilograms per hour and about four kilograms per minute on the EC145 or 240 kilograms per hour. Many modern helicopters have fuel flow indicators that you can use to get accurate figures for different flight conditions and speeds, but it does pay, obviously, to be conservative with your fuel planning. Come on, man, we're getting low on gas. Let's land this sucker. You need to account for fuel for each of the following segments. 
Startup. Now you're burning valuable fuel whilst programming all the avionics and completing your IFR pre-departure checks. Taxi, you have to get from the pad to the runway and at a busy international airport. This may require a long-winded route, a hover power going along various taxiways before you can actually depart. Then take off and climb. Well, you'll used to be climbing at a higher power setting using more fuel at a speed less than your cruise speed. So you'll be going taking a little bit longer to get up to your cruise altitude. Then your transit to destination. This is your point to point time times by your fuel flow at cruise conditions. Then approach and landing at destination. Now, unlike VFR flying, an instrument approach uh, is slightly more long winded. Your initial approach point may be 10 miles or more away from the airfield uh, in a different direction from which you're approaching at. Then you have to think about contingency fuel for accounting for any unexpected delays en route, that should be 10% of your trip fuel. And the final reserve fuel, now that's a legal requirement you must have for landing. If you eat into this, then you're in a full emergency situation. So you need to plan for at least 30 minutes of fuel at holding speed. Now on top of this, then you also need to consider the extra fuel that you need if things don't go to plan. So a missed approach fuel. So you've made your approach to your destination. For whatever reason, the visibility of the cloud base isn't sufficient. You can't see the runway environment. You have to go around. So you need to plan for that missed approach climbing back up to an appropriate altitude, then you need to plan for a transit to your alternate um, and then perform another instrument approach and landing at that alternate airfield. Now, if you need two alternate airfields, then you need to plan that twice uh, for, for the transit from your first alternate again, then to your second alternate accordingly. For a helicopter that's usually fuel restricted for performance, you can see why IFR flight in helicopters can be challenging to legally perform, given the extra fuel that you need to potentially carry on board is at the cost of reducing your passengers or your payload. Now, in flight, you need to be carrying out regular fuel checks at least every 30 minutes or so at each turning point to see if you're on track with your fuel usage. Write this down on your plug, your pilot log, and if there's insufficient to land with an alternate and final fuel reserve intact, then you need to divert or replan on the fly. Now, let's try and use a real world uh, weather scenario as a worked example. Let's use the weather on the 2nd of August, 2023 as a worked example. Just to note, there are a number of factors to consider when planning a flight. For this though, however, we will only focus on the IFR weather considerations alone. This is an IFR flight from Stapleford to Biggin Hill, departing at approximately 14.30 and arrival at Biggin around 1500. Not a long flight at all, but we'll have to assume that we can't get a direct clearance into the London controlled airspace, so the routing goes via an indirect waypoint to the east. Today, the weather is dominated by synoptic activity, with a number of fronts passing east for our intended route, caused by a depression moving in from the Atlantic. The weather is not suitable for a VFR return to the takeoff location, and Stapleford doesn't have an instrument approach, but because Biggin is less than an hour away, we can use it as our takeoff alternate. The weather at Biggin Hill is not suitable for a VFR descent, below the minimum safe altitude of 2,300 feet, or the initial approach altitude of 1800 feet but it is a pro above the minimums required for the ILS approach so you only need one alternate airfield which is nominated as south end eg mc for the ILS runway this is decided as follows the worst weather for Biggin is set to be three kilometers in thunderstorm rain and heavy showers with the cloud base broken at 1200 feet the minimums for Biggin are 209 feet for the decision height and an an RVR of 750 metres, although this raises to 800 metres if you're flying a single pilot, and the conditions are above this. For South End to be an appropriate diver airfield, we need to check the decision altitude or decision height and the minimum visibility requirements are suitable for the weather forecast and now either side of our arrival. For the NDB ILS DME 23 approach plate, the decision height is 200 feet with a 600 meet, meter RVR. Now this comes from a separate copter only plate. For an alternate, we need to add 200 feet to the decision height and 400 meters to the minimum RVR. And therefore we need the cloud base to be greater than 400 feet and one kilometer visibility. From the tap, we can see the lowest weather we can expect in this period of flight is a temporary drop to three kilometers with showered rain and a cloud base of 1200 feet. There, there is a risk of cumulus nimbus activity in the vicinity. Hopefully this video has been some use to demystifying the planning requirements of an IFR flight. And until next time, fly safe. Thanks for watching.